Uh, Kosa, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow managed to get an extra T and a K in there, so it looked very strange for a while. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this is going to be a very informal presentation and demo. And uh, I encourage you to interrupt and discuss things as we go. Um, this feature, we think, is not as complex as the spreadsheet feature. Um, but it definitely um, has lots of possibilities. We, we think that it's a fairly simple feature that might open up some interesting opportunities for remote work, uh, for staff, and for um, other kinds of metadata work. for different types of material yeah like three-dimensional yeah. objects or photographs or yeah this posters. is this is this is uh, quite different from what we're used to um, we didn't realize that until we had developed it and started chatting with Meredith and realized oh oh wow you could do this too so um, we encourage any kind of brainstorming during this okay so um, we're just going to explain a little bit about the goals of the project uh, kind of where it comes from, where our limitations are, then we're gonna dive into a live demo, fingers crossed as always, uh, then chat about workflow possibilities and then just have open discussion. So you're all familiar with From the Page, um, originally developed for uh, material like this. You have a single page being transcribed um, as uh, plain text, right? Or, or text with markup. Right, so we have this mapping of um, a single image and what users are creating is unstructured text. So in 2018, thanks to COSA funding, we added the ability to um, do structured transcription, right? So these field-based transcription projects, and this will be very familiar to Liz. This is a great <laughs> example of uh, one image created creating a structured data um, result that could be exported in a spreadsheet. Um, then earlier this year, we added the ability to do uh, multiple record transcription. Um, so this is again, thanks to COSA. Uh, but again, we have one image that is producing multiple records. Now that is not something that really works for item level metadata except in a handful of cases. Now, this is an example that Ohio University Libraries is doing. It's a private project, so you might not have seen it before, um, but it is a metadata project in which they are creating item level metadata about posters. So they're using the field-based transcription feature to transcribe a whole bunch of from the page works that they've uploaded that each only have one image. Right, so the image is a poster. They're getting structured data out the other end. Um, they're having staff members do this. Um, and, and they're creating item level metadata for these items. Um, the only reason they're able to use the existing functionality to, to do this though, is that their items are single image items, right? Um, they're not the kinds of records that um, you have with digitized, um, digitized letters or digital, you know, there's lots of other cases in which, um, right, most archival documents are not a single page, right? So um, historically, the functionality as it existed a month or two ago was that um, to create archive, for, for, for doing archival description, to create metadata, the problems that we had with the existing software was that the, the target, right, creating metadata is metadata about items, not pages within the items, right? Uh, and to do that, the person doing the creation often needs to see more than one page. If you're, if you're dealing with um, books, for example, right, you, you need to be able to look at the title page, you need to be able to flip and look at the copyright page to create the kind of catalog metadata you'd get. Um, that wasn't something that was possible at all uh, with From the Page. Um, the process of metadata creation might be totally separate from transcription. You might have projects that don't do transcription at all. Um, and the people creating metadata might be different from the public style 
of projects that we're used to running in which you have the crowd creating uh, transcriptions or indexing records, right? They're not necessarily um, trained to create metadata. So let's talk about where the sources that you need to use to create useful metadata. Um, so you can create metadata based on looking at images, right? And that's what we originally uh, designed this feature for. And then partway through, we realized that projects that had already transcribed some material might want users to be able to read the transcribed text so that they would not have, you know, if you had a crowdsource transcription project and then you were asking people to describe metadata and they were different people, those second people, you know, should be able to use the transcripts rather than having to puzzle out the handwriting from scratch again. And then after talking with Meredith a couple of times during the development of this process, we realized that there's a third potential source for metadata creation, and that is old metadata. Right, you might want to look at existing metadata for items and use that to create new metadata about those items. So the outcomes that we see, kind of the goals of this, one goal is new metadata, um, you know, items that simply don't have descriptions or you're collecting new fields about items that were not in the original metadata. Um, that's one great outcome. Right. Another outcome, and I'm sorry that Ashley from North Carolina isn't on this call, um, is different kinds of metadata, right? There's lots of cases in which the public might use very different terms to describe material uh, from the terms that would be used by an archivist. And so being able to uh, ask the public, you know, what, what they want to say might, might give you some metadata fields that would enable public access by adding those to things like searches and, and catalog records. Uh, we also realized that this would be useful for um, translating metadata. So if you have material that's all in English uh, and you would like it translated into Spanish, it might be reasonable to say, um, all right, let's, you know, here, here are the same fields, please provide the Spanish for these. Um, and then finally, revising metadata, right? There's um, lots of archives conferences I see uh, talk about addressing archival description that was done 100 years ago and embodied a lot of the ways of talking about people that were common then, but we don't like to use now, particularly about indigenous people or other, other underrepresented groups. So being able to use a feature to enable uh, revision of existing metadata is another big piece of this another goal. Okay, ready for the demo? Any questions so far? Yeah, any, any questions so far? That's that's a great question before I jump in. Nothing? Okay. All right, so this is a private project that I've created and I'd be if you want to play with it, I'm happy to open it up to any of you. And I have imported a handful of letters from the portal to Texas history. Um, so right now, this is just the normal default flow of, you know, here's a page to transcribe and I can click through the next, uh, the rest of the pages, um, and I have unstructured text to transcribe into. So what we're going to do is um, uh, configure this project and we are going to enable metadata description. And that will make this a metadata description project and take us into a new tab for metadata fields, right? And this is gonna look very similar to the field-based transcription configuration screen you're used to and the spreadsheet transcription uh, screen you're used to, uh, except one of the differences is that the first thing you're prompted to do is say, well, should people be able to transcribe and describe, or should should this be a metadata creation only project? Up to you. It's up to you. And you can change projects from one kind to another. You can disable metadata description, you can enable it. Um, no data is going to be lost if you do that. In fact, I, we think there's, we're not sure what the right approach is. We suspect that doing transcription and description or metadata creation 
kind of hand in hand makes the most sense. So hopefully someone would transcribe a letter and then they would be in the context of that letter and they would be able to answer the questions um, that you ask about it. When was it written? Where was it written to? But you know, there's other possibilities of, of how you yeah. choose to, to make this workflow happen. Right, right. For, for a pure crowd project that's working with correspondence like this example, transcribe then describe makes perfect sense. But that's not the only kind of project that people will be running, and that's not the only kind of source, right? Correspondence is uh, is great, but it's not dance yeah. posters or cards. Yeah. Or... Yes. Okay. We, yeah. so with our with our slave schedules, we actually have done just the opposite, sort of. Mm -hmm. We've gone in and indexed pages that only had header information okay. ourselves at the very beginning of a project. So I could see you going through with a met with a large project like that and adding this is a blank page. This doesn't actually have the data we want on the front end. And then then I don't know how you would do it, but separating those pages. So um, so that you're only doing really truly on that second pass, the transcription. That's an interesting point because so for you know many of especially the COSA records, you've got, you know let's call it a book that's got a bunch of header information, which might be best captured as, as metadata um, or, you know, introductory stuff. And then transcription of just the pages after that. I think I would probably use that mark blank feature for the ones that you wanted to skip. So what I would do is kind of upload the book, do create a, a metadata description field like Ben's kind of working on demonstrating right now for capturing that, that front matter um, and then I would probably go through the transcription of those those front matter pages and I just check that blank, 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 um, and then leave the other ones, if that makes sense. We can talk about that more too when we get to specific projects, but I think that's a good point that we need to think through. So Ben is in the middle of creating a metadata, set of metadata fields. Um, these have exactly the same field types as you're used to seeing with field-based transcription, um, except that we added a new one, which you're going to demonstrate, right? right? Yes. <laughs> um, the new field type is a multi-select type. So we realize that you know, many libraries and archives use things like Library of Congress subject headings to categorize things. Um, and that things may fall into multiple categories. Um, so that's what multi-select for. I'm just gonna show you how that works. So you select multi-select, you have to save it, and then you have this option to configure your options. Okay, so these are from 1918. So I'm gonna assume that they're talking about or And we did this as a pop-up with a pretty big field here, so you could copy and paste in a list that you had developed for a right. project. This is a this this can take a lot of options. Okay, another distinction here is that we also have a date field. Um, this is similar to the field the, the date fields that we have in uh, spreadsheet transcription, but previously field-based transcription does not have a date field. Um, so we can see the preview here. Document date is this ISO style YYY MMDD. You don't have to use it. You can use a string, a text instead if you don't like the kind of masked out ISO format. Okay, so that's, that's just the preview, but we are, I believe, done with this. So let's see how this works. Okay, so this is, as we said earlier, a combo transcription description project. And so I'm going to transcribe just a tiny little bit. Belmont, New Mexico, maybe. Belmont NM, October 26th, 1918. My dear pretty, I can't help but wonder about you. Worry, I think. Oh. Okay. I have, and we're okay. going to stop right, stop right there, I think. Um, and we'll 
save this, but it's not actually done yet. And then I'm just for the sake of uh, demonstration going to see if we can get to the very end to see if there's anything about the person who's writing. And uh, sadly, no, but I can see that. Up close to Cloudcroft. Right, so that's just the transcription stage. Um, and you've all seen that before. But we now have this extra step so that if you're in a dual transcription and description workflow, after you're done transcribing, hitting the next button prompts you to enter the metadata. Um, so and notice that we're kind of popped out and we're now at the item level with overview, describe, and help, which is not where we were a minute ago, which was the page level. So it's a little bit, the UI is a little bit different here. 1918. October 26th. October 26th. 26th. And Belmont. We, have, oh. we do know where it came from. And uh, recipient is pretty. Oh, right. Okay, not the sender. And we have no idea about these other things, um, but we know subjects. We're talking about domestic life. And um, let me page through it and see what else is in there. All right. Okay. Right. This is a great <laughs> point. So um, the other thing that's interesting about this description screen is that um, you can see without losing where you are in the data entry, you can page through all of the pages. Um, well, it's actually about the flu, the 1918 flu. Oh, right. The okay, flu the is about is as bad as it has ever been at Alamo. Yeah. Wow. Um, right. So when you're describing items, you can see any of the pages in a work. So that um, it's the same viewer we use for transcription. Sonia just had a comment that it's really convenient. Um, it's the same viewer we use for transcription, um, just configured differently so that you can page through things. So that's, right. that's pretty nice. So you've got the thumbnails over here, but you also have the ability to page back and forth in the viewer. So I'm going to save this change. Okay, so that is the transcription and description flow. Oh, you know, there's one thing I forgot to show, which is that um, if I want to, as I'm typing, I can switch from viewing the original images to viewing the original text. And that will show me any text that's in here, whether it's transcribed or whether it's OCR that's been imported. Um, I also have the ability to view the original metadata if any has been imported, right? So um, this is material that was added by the portal to Texas history where I imported this from. But if for some reason uh, there are fields here that are not mentioned, you know, like these subjects, for example, um, or places right, where this is sent from, right? We, we don't have a, um, a place that is where this was created. So we could be pulling Belmont, New Mexico out here and adding that to this metadata. That looks like they knew who sent it and uh, and received it. So yeah, it, it looks like they. Uh, it looks like they had the envelopes but didn't scan them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's modify this to create a pure description project. So I go into my metadata fields and say users only create metadata and save that. So now let's go to a different image. And this, and you can see we skipped any kind of transcription, transcription step. This dropped us directly into metadata description. So let's see what this is. Um, the document date, 1918. 10, 13. 13. Oh. 10, 13, there we go. All right, um, and so we can look through this and see, all right, what else What else do we know about this? Um, Let's go to the last page, which would be where I would look for more. Is that the last page? No, 
Here we go. It's from Marguerite, who has the post office now. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But... Love to you, Marguerite. Who has the post office now? Okay. Well, so the sender is Marguerite. And the recipient is pretty. During World War I, sometimes letters would be circular. So she may have been forwarding mail from overseas and that kind of thing. Oh, oh interesting. Uh, one of these letters, as I imported it and was looking, um, is from the, the USS Huron at New York. So I thought that was interesting. Um, OK, so we're going to say that this is about shipping. No, it's not. But... It's not. <laughs> Okay, so that's a description only example. And again, we can, you know, if there were text, we could pull that in, um, but we can also pull in the metadata and see what they're talking about. So let's talk about getting data out. So you can go to your export screen. And for, you know, you're used to seeing a lot more in your export screens, but for, projects that are set to only be metadata description, we, we kind of hide all of the uh, export formats that are uh, I'm not specific actually sure is the right thing to do, because if you're going to do a multi-stage project, you might do metadata oh, at the right. end, but you might want to export everything at the end. Right. So we should think through that okay. some more, because it made sense when we did this, but I, I'm not sure it makes sense now. OK, let me open up that exported document. And I need to stop my share and then share my spreadsheet program. Okay, so uh, this is the work metadata export, which uh, already exists, but we, we use this to add all these metadata description elements to it. Um, so we start off with uh, standard information about what collection it is, what, what um, if there was any document sets, what the uploaded file name was, uh, slugs and URLs, so you can get back to these things. Um, and then there's statistics about if there was any transcription. Okay, then we have a set of columns that are the imported metadata. So any metadata that you imported either via CMS or if you uploaded a metadata spreadsheet, that's going to appear here so that you can correlate the old metadata to the, the newly created metadata. So these are all things that came in from the portal to Texas history. Then we get the actual metadata description. Uh, so there's a column for description status and who it was described by. So we can see we have two items that have been described. And then these are followed by columns for the, um, the actual metadata that was provided. So you can see Marguerite, Belmont, New Mexico, pretty, the subjects. Um, if you have more than one subject, how are they separated? Uh, they should be separated by semicolons, but it looks like we may, did, did we actually create more than one subject for these? Mm, I don't think so, we should try that. Okay, that. we should. It, yeah. when, I'm, when, when we originally developed this, we separated subjects by semicolons. Um, sorry, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Questions about this export? No? Okay. All right. So I'm gonna, Does uh, the so, data show up other places uh, and other exports? Uh, this is the only place the data shows up right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have thought about adding it to our JSON APIs, to our IIIF manifests. Um, we're not quite sure yet how to differentiate between metadata that's created here versus metadata that's more authoritative that was provided by the institution during the import process. Um, so we're not we're not mm -hmm. we're not sure yet. Yeah. We, yeah. We, don't... we don't want to be making decisions about what's your authoritative metadata that you're going to show to users. So right. this is not it's not in you know the PDF exports or the Word exports or the text or TEI exports. So that's something I think, you know, if we'd like feedback on if you. Yeah, we're, we're very interested in doing this, but we want to do it right. So if there's specific use cases and we should say, you know, hey, we really want to use it this way, let's add it, right? Uh, we just, 
we don't want a situation in which somebody could create metadata and then do a PDF export and say, look, this says Bozo the Clown wrote this letter or something. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my presentation. Okay, so let's talk about what some of the possible workflows might be. Um, you know, we talked about simultaneous transcription and metadata creation. We talked about metadata creation only, but we also have the ability to um, switch projects from one state and one workflow to another. So you can have a project that's been fully transcribed. You could switch it to be a metadata creation only project so that people only are creating metadata about documents that have been transcribed or indexed. But they have the transcription available to reference. To work from, yeah. right. Um, or maybe you've already done all the transcription because this is a brand new feature and you can go back and add this to it. Right. Um, there's also the possibility of saying that certain, you know, if you take one of these projects and you make it public facing and you get through a phase of either transcription or metadata creation, you can make the project private. And having made the project private, you can do things like say, well, only staff can do this next phase. So only staff can create metadata. Um, you can also add fields. So you could do a handful of public friendly metadata creation fields as part of a uh, crowd metadata creation project. And then you could add additional ones for staff work only make the project private and ask the staff to go add those additional fields. Um, then there's also the possibility of pulling in the existing metadata and having just staff in-house or remote work projects to revise metadata from, you know, whatever already exists in your systems to new fields. Um, right, and then finally, translation of existing metadata with the context of the images and stuff is also very possible. So Sonia has a, a comment. I can definitely see using this for subject tagging. Yeah, I think the key is gonna be having a, the right list. I don't know, but you guys probably know more about that than I do, but I don't, I don't know how much any of us have done a lot of tagging as crowdsourced activity. Um, right, and, and it's a, it's an interesting question because the kinds of subject, you know, the, 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 if it's a crowdsourced project, the subject, the, the crowd doesn't necessarily think in Library of Congress subject headings. Um, that doesn't mean what they provide isn't useful, but we, we kind of need to see how that's Well, works. we had that conversation. So Ashley Yandel at North Carolina um, actually wrote her library school thesis on words people use to when they're looking for things in the archives and how those words are really different from words that um, archivists and librarians use when they're describing things. Um, so she, I think one of the examples she gave us a couple of years ago was, you know, vintage agriculture pictures, right? You're looking for something in black and white or black and white, old uh, things that you want to use for you know, decorating your house or your restaurant. Um, and that isn't necessarily going to be the same words that, that a professional would use. And how important, I don't know whether I, you guys probably have done all the theory on what's the right approach there. Um, so, yeah. So no one uses Library of Congress subject headings except librarians. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. yes. Yeah. But you know, maybe when people know that, you know, that they find one thing, they're like, oh, well, let me click on this thing because maybe the, the other vintage pig pictures will be underneath there, right? But. So yeah, we're, we're curious to see how the, the subject tagging as a, a task works out. So go, go experiment and let us know. Um, I think we all would be interested in that. So, you know, the, when we showed this early on to Meredith, she came up with a lot of ideas that we had not envisioned at all in terms of how this might be usable for staff remote work or for kinds of projects they were doing. Um, so we, We'd love to get feedback. We'd love for y'all to use this and see what you know what you do with it, um, because right, we we're not archivists. We don't have library degrees, um, and so the more that we can watch what you're doing and then spread the word, the more that once this feature becomes generally available, we can point to some best practices or some good use cases um, for kind of the the broader community. So this is available to you 
now, um, when I send out a follow-up email with the recording and everything, I'll include the link for turning it on. Um, there's a handful of, of changes, mostly some wording changes that we wanted to make, and it doesn't have um, the review feature. You can't, you can't set things up needing review for metadata description yet. We are building that in. That was something Meredith thought was very important and she's right, um, <laughs> we just yeah. didn't do it. Um, so that's kind of the biggest limitation, um, but that's coming. Yeah. yeah. Richard says there's analogs that are browsing guides, photocopies of photographs that are popular with researchers. They're organized by general and general subjects and uh, specific subjects. So being able to do that with collections is, so yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So um, one, the, the general versus specific is kind of interesting. Um, there was an example, there was an early crowdsourcing project in the Netherlands about 10 years ago uh, that did video tagging and it, it had video archives and it would present end users with snippets of this, this really popular, I think it was a comedy show that had run in the 70s and 80s and people had very fond memories of it. And what they found was that the terms that people were using to, to tag these um, were very different from the ones that, not just that archivists would use, but the ones that anyone would use to describe a, t a half hour TV episode because people were describing the scenes that they were shown a snippet of. Okay, and the thing is that turned out to be very useful because you know someone going into AV archives doesn't necessarily say, I want to see season three, episode five. They say, I want to see the episode that has this, you know, this funny beach ball scene or this fish slapping scene. And because people had tagged these little snippets with with, oh, this is, you know, this is this, you know, the Monty Python funny walk scene or something, then people were able to find those. Um, more easily, but we'll see. Oh, local subject headings, John says. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that seems like a really interesting possible use case. We've definitely seen some, I guess Indianapolis Public Library has this project that they haven't launched yet, but they have this collection of photographs of local parks, but they don't know which park it is. They know it's all the local parks, but they don't know which park each photograph is. And I, I I feel like photo identification is a totally different crowdsource task. I have a whole design, but it's like not even, I, I'm like, no, not even a from the page thing. Like it's like, you kind of want a, a almost a dating app sort of, of interface where you can just look at a bunch of stuff. And when you see something, you know, then you can add data about it. Um, but I think if it's, if it's a limited enough set, then you might be able to, to do tagging in, in a system like this. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, the first thing I had on my list was actually photographs. Like if we had a collection of 80,000 wildlife photos from the Department of Conservation, I don't know the difference between a tufted titmouse and a whatever, you know? So it would be great to let, you know, people who do those kinds of things do those kinds of things. Um, and in some instances, we have an index, but in other instances, we don't. And in some indexes, I'm pretty sure that the conservation photographer was a good photographer and not an ornithologist. Um, and so I could definitely see photographs being a project um, to do that. And it, 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 am I right in saying, though, that you can provide metadata existing with this and then add to that metadata and from your spreadsheet, then it kind of differentiates between uh, whose metadata is whom. Yeah, so you can create metadata and from the page um, after you've imported items, you can we give you a template spreadsheet that you can download and then you could you can correlate based on like the file name um, with something some other source that you have and you can uh, if you can copy those fields in then you can upload it and we will show you that uploaded spreadsheet metadata as your original metadata. Um, if you depending on what your asset management system is like the one we were showing the portal to Texas history, they publish all their metadata and IIIF manifests. And we just pull that in. We do that for content DM, um, uh, some other library systems like tend. tend would do that. Yeah. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're coming from, but we can always, we can always test it and see. Um, but 
kind of the fallback is there's a spreadsheet, right? You can upload a spreadsheet after you've gotten your stuff in and, and kind of match it up. And one follow up there, can we import metadata for the table, um, the tabular indexing as well now? Yep. Yeah. That's always, so importing metadata has been around for a while. We have about four different ways to get metadata into from the page. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of evolved over time. I think we'll do a whole webinar at some point that talks about all the ways to get metadata in and, and out and what yeah. to do with it. This is number four. Yeah, this is number four, <laughs> yes. Um, all right, I'm just thinking that it would be great for a cleanup tool kind of thing too, where you already have a poorly done transcription or or um, table, and you, you, you know, you could maybe have staff that you could use it to clean up. Too, but yeah, that's off topic. Well, no, this is part of what we realized after we started building this. So, you know, with COVID, people started doing some transcription as as work from home, especially at universities that have a lot of student workers and and things like that. But you know, I think we all. Well, we work from home all the time, but you know, there's a, a bigger drive right now to give people the opportunity to work from home at, at certain points in time or you know, part of their days or their, their weeks and being able to do metadata description um, or update old stuff and be able to do it from home is, I think people are gonna do that. It's gonna be interesting to see. So um, Sonia has a link that she put in about a uh, example of a project that was trying to do photo identification and transcription software. And she's like, Sonia, can you, are you someplace you can talk? Yeah, I can chime in. Um, so we did try to do sort of a photo identification project on some, um, on a transcription platform using Omeka and Scripto. And I think because that is just a very open text entry field, it's not, um, you couldn't necessarily say, oh, we only want names, dates, places for these items. Um, people just gave very general descriptions like, oh, a group of people laughing in the snow or, you know, things like that, that they thought they were just, um, that was what they were meant to do. So I think it's a very, it's a hard shift to make in mindset of your volunteers and users to get them to tag things correctly. Uh, so yeah, I agree with you just that that might be a very different interface, um, but it's worth trying and seeing maybe it would work better on from the page than in, in Omeka, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm curious what you're doing. Are you doing anything with those general descriptions? Because I think that is the Ashley dissertation example which is you know people playing in the snow is sometimes people are searching for that right yes and this was a collection that we were hosting for um, another organization colonial williamsburg here in virginia so i actually think that those user generated descriptions are very helpful so i'm not sure if they will use those uh but i plan to export and give them everything so we'll see how it goes mm -hmm. Um, my other question, something that I was thinking of, you know, I think the work from home possibilities for this are amazing. And we generally like to create some basic metadata before we put things up for transcription. So I think our workflow may be reversed and that we want to do metadata creation by staff first mm -hmm. and then export the CSV and re-import that so that it shows up for the public with like title, date, whatever. Mm. Um, and then push it out as a transcription project. Yeah, that would most closely match our current workflow. Yeah, you would have to do it in two steps like you're talking, which is, you know, project one is you create the metadata and export it. Project two is you re-import everything and you import your exported spreadsheet in order to get it in a non-editable format, right? You could just turn on transcription, um, well, I mean, oh, I was, you could, you know, well, what are you just, well, I mean, well, think, so, but so it wouldn't show up in the right place. Right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that because it might be possible to do it in place without having to have the export and import. That two-step process. Yeah, well, yeah, a, a much, yeah, we, we might be able to... Um, what if you could publish metadata? Like there's, or approve, well, so we don't have a review and approve implemented yet, but arguably if it's approved, maybe by staff, this is the thing is you don't have to have, I, I don't know who... Um, yeah. Then we could pull it into the the about page and the kind of the, the formal metadata. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to think about yeah, something like that would be really interesting to us. Um, or if you know after you've completed the metadata description, if you could switch it back to being just transcribe only. Um, you can do that. 
Okay. Absolutely can do that. But, but you can't see the metadata. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But we would mm -hmm. be able to, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we, it, let's, let's keep talking about this because I think that it would, the work mm -hmm. might, depending on what you're trying to do, the work to get there might be minimal. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Using the example that you had uh, with uh, New Mexico letters um, and having worked with in a former job at the Memphis Public Library, um, a lot of documentary film crews, they always would bring us what I call a noun list. Um, and so they were looking for influenza, for instance, which we see in that letter that you all gave an example. Although their noun list would be literally the script that they're running from, and it's every noun in the list, like running water or like like the flowing river was one of them. We, they're wanting still photos that they could make look like a, a like a boat running down the river or whatever. And we actually found some things that they worked with. But um, so um, I think that one of the values of this would be to give letters or. Um, and I'm not talking about transcription here. I'm talking about totally using this to not transcribe um, because it's a lot faster to go through a document and pull out the things that people will use and actually transcribe it. Um, so, um, but I think this would be useful for that noun list, but how do we get it to be able to take the flu and make it FLU and influenza and Spanish influenza how do we add those tags as well and keep those discrete? Like, here is what it says, and here um, are the logical extensions of this. So, you know, we have that with the full text transcription. Um, so we do subject linking, we use wiki links, and you take the verbatim text, F-L-U-E, and you can link it to a canonical subject name like influenza. Um, it doesn't get you the synonyms, but you could, there's, you know, once you've, once you've got it linked to your canonical name, I think there's ways you could do your, syn your synonyms. Um, In terms of just doing this, you're really talking about, you know, if you wanted to do this just as metadata description as a staff project, just, you know, skim the letters, add some tags. Um, right now, you would need to have flu and sickness and Spanish influenza already populated as as the things that people were selecting from for subjects right because we wanted that to be a controlled vocabulary well and i'm curious like what are your systems for doing this these lists get really long how do we how do we design a really good inter interface that lets you look at a, a really long list and pick the right stuff um we really designed this for you to present a kind of a, a just enough set, right? We don't, well, the, and, the, the user interface that we're using, people can start typing into that box mm -hmm. and then it, it it does a little search and narrows down. So you type right. S and it pulls up shipping and sickness, for example, and then you can pick one of those. But you still have to know what's on the list-ish in order to get that right. And I hmm. think there's there's another interface possibility, which is show me everything that's on the list so I can pick the right thing. Um, and I don't know, I mean, if you click on it right now, do you, you get a drop down, right? Or do you get anything? Yeah, you get a yeah, drop down. Yeah, you get a drop down. So we'll show you everything that you've typed in, but if that's a hundred things, that's not very usable. Um, so I'd be curious about user interfaces that make it work better with longer controlled vocabularies. Um, again, though, for crowd projects, I'm not sure I'm gonna really strongly recommend longer controlled vocabularies. I'm not sure the, the, the crowd really wants that, but for staff projects, it makes more sense. Um, so. so family search used to use that in their data entry for the, I think it was the 1940 uh, census indexing. And the first week, um, and was with surnames, I think is what it was, and first names. So the first week, um, you it was pretty helpful. And then by the second or third week, the list was so long. Um, that, you know, you have a Polish name and you got to the end, you, you didn't know whether it was an I or a Y, you know, you basically had to type the entire thing and then it would give you the choice of, do you want a Y or an I on the end of it? Yes. So it was absolutely useless by the end. Right. I mean, it's a comparable thing. It's not exactly what you're talking about, but I think it's illustrative of your problem. Right, right. That's it more, 
slightly more emergent in terms of what the control, you know, it was an emergent vocabulary. But, but it's but still, still a function of the, the size, yeah. the total inventory of matches that people are choosing from. Yeah. It is, you don't want it to be too long. Yeah. yeah. And it grew, I mean, every day it was expanding astronomically. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we are really curious what you make of this. Um, so please let us know, try it out. Let us know how it works. Tell us what else you'd like with it. Mm -hmm. How um, you're using it, because yeah. we're curious about that. Yeah, we are very curious mm -hmm. and we would love to have stories to point people to of how this how they can use this as well right great okay. an idea of how we might use this and with social media even but i don't want to blow up from the page is um could we post like a, a request for um adding metadata to social media with a direct link to one image out here and then let people add those nouns and details. What do you see in the background? Ooh. And is there bandwidth to where that you'd have a hundred people at once hitting a specific page? Okay, so what you want to do, let's say a Facebook post that you'd right. like to have described. Um, so the first question is, we don't really have a model for importing things like that. Do you wait, have wait, them? Wait. He's, he's saying you've got something hosted on from the page and then you post about it on social media. Oh, right. And oh, you drive a lot of business to one link. Yeah. Uh, currently only one person can edit the metadata at once. Uh, that would not work. Okay. So that, you know, simultaneous editing would not work. Well, if you had people who came by in passes, we store all the revisions and, you know, all the version control. Well, we sections. actually let multiple people edit at once. It's just the last person to hit save is the one that wins. Um, we would save the previous versions of it. Um, and everyone except the first person sees a warning. Yeah, they get a warning. Okay. But they, they, okay. Anyway, that, yeah. that would be a fun thing to do, I think, uh, yeah. for folks to be able to go in and look you know, at, you know, my office background and say, wow, that looks like a, you know, a Memphis um, street scene or whatever that it is in the background. Because uh, sometimes there's a lot of really interesting things in the back of photog uh, photographs or uh, whatever it might be, or in the letter example of you just pulling all those nouns out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people, the, the value from a social media standpoint to me, and you could still do it just with the comments on social media, um, but the value of it to me is, you know, that people will be able to tweak it out and say, oh, wow, you know, that's the earliest recorded snowfall on that mountain range in, in New Mexico or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, people tease out the weirdest details from these. Yes. Things. Yes. You know, we've talked about doing um, social share buttons on an individual page and, and from the page as a way to encourage more transcribers to, you know, you're transcribing, share it on your Facebook page or on Twitter, and, and maybe more people will come and work. Um, and we should, we have an open issue for that. It's been around for years. <laughs> um, but here's the deal, John, we can experiment with this. I mean, if you do two or three, right, and let's see what people like, let's see if people complain. Let's, I mean, as long as you're willing to take a little bit of that risk, yeah. we can all see how it works. And maybe the answer is it's terrible and we shouldn't do this, but maybe the answer. <laughs> No one actually clicks through except for two people and they're doing it an hour apart, which means it's fine. Yeah, we don't have it, to sound, it, it sounds like to me that you say, hey, we posted um, a dozen photos or a hundred photos and it maybe spreads the load out mm -hmm. um, to do a small project like that or 20 or something like that, yeah. um, as opposed to sending them to one page. Yes. Um, that might be a better approach to that. I, I think we don't have a big enough Facebook following um, to where that um, we would crash a bigger project like that with warnings, but we we do have an interested enough audience that we could maybe crash it with just one. I'm not that worried about. I mean, it's it's when they go viral that's the problem, right? But like normal use, I'm not that worried yeah. about crashing the server. I am worried about the experience of the person doing the transcription work. Yeah, you don't want a situation where somebody comes in and they're all excited to, to do this and it's already all done. Right. I was, or, using, I was using crash and the flu, flu influenza, Spanish influenza. So, yeah. So yeah. no, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's a technology issue, but I didn't experience issue. For, 
Yeah. And we, you know, we have a, a guest user flow and you, we would want to make sure it worked well in that, in that sort of yes. case, because it'd be people coming in who were not necessary, who probably didn't have from the page accounts. So. In general, just for social media posting, I mean, at least what works for us is to point to that collection level and then let them be sort of self-guided and select the specific document or page they want to work on themselves. Um, yeah, and also with posting on social media, if you post just one image, you're going to end up getting a lot of comments on social media with no way to then get those that information back over to from the page or whatever system you're in. Like if you post an image on Twitter and say, what is this? You'll get a million replies and well, maybe not a million. You'll get a lot of replies of varying degrees of accuracy and they won't be in the system where you want them is at least my experience um, on social media. So yeah, I would use the collection level link if it would meet. I'm trying to figure out a way to balance that engagement with value. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's about all we have. Um, we look forward to any feedback you have. And when you actually start using it, let us know how it goes. Please. And again, thanks for all the support and all the input. Thanks. We'd never come up with this on our own. And it's going to be so amazing. Yeah. Sarah and Ben, can y'all hold on for just a second? I have an unrelated question. Sure. Yeah. I heard one other person speak up. So. I'm going to stop recording. And, and